Great. I'd like to call the, uh, I'd like to call the planning board meeting for the city of Boulder, Thursday, September 3rd, 2020, uh, meeting to order um, at 6.02 p.m. We have a quorum of five, uh, everyone present uh, except uh, Montoya and Smith. Um, the first item is to turn it over to Jean to provide us with some context and rules for our uh, online hearing. Jean? That sounds great. Thanks, Harmon. Let me just get to screen share here. And great. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, and welcome to the City of Boulder Planning Board meeting. We're glad everyone's here. Um, in aiming to keep these meetings respectful and orderly, we have some specific protocol for the meeting. I'll just run through this really quickly. Um, any activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. And just as it would be if we were meeting in person, time for speaking or asking questions is limited. So either I or the board chair will recognize applicants or members of the public to speak, and we will unmute you. We'll need every, anyone attending to address the board and use a full name in your, um, in the na in your name box. If your na full name is not currently displayed, please change it um, or send it to me in the chat and I'm happy to change it for you. No other video will be permitted except for board, staff, and applicants. All others will participate by voice only. Um, Harmon and I, let me see, okay, here we go. Um, Harmon and I or Cindy, if she's the acting host, will enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates the rules, so please don't do that. Um, the chat function should only be used for technical issues to communicate with me or Cindy as the host. So no questions about the specific content um, of the item um, under review ton tonight. And then only staff and board members will be allowed to share their screens. When we get to the public hearing, um, members of the public will use the raised hand function to indicate that you'd like to speak during the public hearings. And you should find this easily on the bottom of your screen. I will call on those who have raised hands and then unmute them and testimony will be by voice only. Participants on the phone, if we had any, or, um, if we have any coming up, um, may press star nine to indicate that you'd like to speak during the public hearing, public participation or public hearing. And I'll aim to tee up several speakers at a time. Um, folks will have three minutes each to address the board. Um, let's see, I think that's, we are not using the Q&A function tonight, nor are we pooling time for this meeting. Did I miss anything? Not that I can no. think of. Lisa's back. Lisa, Lisa is here. Okay. Um, and I will make Lisa and Luke uh, co-hosts in just a second. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, Harmon, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Um, let the record show that Lisa Smith has joined the meeting. Uh, it's 6.05. She, let's, let's give her a, a minute or two extra. Let's say she came in at 6.03. <laughs> uh, the, the, the thing that I, I forgot last week. Oh, she was earlier than that. Okay. We're, we're not supposed to use the, the chat, but for that, I think we can make an exception. So we can just say the meeting started with six planning board members present. Um, I want to make a public service announcement for the 2020 census. Uh, a couple of weeks ago I did and last week I forgot. Um, so for anybody who hasn't responded to your census form, there is still time to respond to the 2020 census. Don't be left out. Your response matters. Completing the census is safe, easy, and convenient. The questionnaire only takes a few minutes to complete. Your responses are secure and confidential, and results help direct billions of dollars in federal funds to our community, including resources for emergencies and disaster responses. Please also encourage your friends and family to respond by the September 30th deadline at my2020census.gov or by calling 844-330-2020. That's 844-330-2020. So your civic duty and your constitutional obligation and respond to the census. Okay, next order of business. Uh, I think we have um, approval of minutes. There are none. Um, public participation will be the next item on the agenda. So uh, what we do during public participation is we offer an opportunity for members of the public to speak to any item that isn't on the public hearing calendar. 
uh, but would be appropriate to speak to the planning board about. You'll have three minutes to speak and the moderator will be Jean Gatza again. So Jean, if you wanna handle public participation. Thanks Harmon, again, um, if anyone would like to speak during open comment, please use the raise hand function um, at the bottom of your screen and I will be able to call on you. I am seeing no raised hands. Thanks, Jean. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna mute myself there. Um, then our next item is item four on our agenda, which is discussion of dispositions, planning board call-ups and continuations. Uh, the only thing under this agenda item is one call-up item, which is floodplain development permit FLD 2020-00056 4270 19th Street, demolition and replacement of a single family dwelling. The decision may be called up by planning board on or before September 7th, 2020. Is there any member of the planning board that has any questions, comments, or, or anything else they want to uh, do regarding this call up, including calling it up? Okay, then let the record show no member of planning board called up the call up item and we'll move on to agenda item number five, which is our uh, single public hearing item for the night. Uh, this uh, agenda title is Public Hearing and Consideration of a Site Review to Redevelop the 9,833 square foot or 0 0.225 acre property at 1619, sorry, 1629 17th Street with six attached dwelling units in the RH2 Residential High 2 Zoning District. That's LUR 2018 triple zero thirty four and before we um, turn it over to staff um, as planning board members let's uh, do our um, let's do our uh, duty to um, uh, disclose any uh, ex parte communications or or other matters that we need to disclose before we take on this quasi judicial task is there anyone who has uh, I, walk, Sarah. I, walk, I went over to see the site. Okay. So Sarah's made a site visit, John? Yes, I've also made a site visit. Okay. John, you're a little bit faint um, when you speak, so I don't know if you're, you're not usually hard to hear. Maybe your microphone's under something. Okay, I hope not. I, I said I had made a site visit. And okay. I'll fiddle with my volume control to try and make it better. Oh, it's perfect now. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to make what, what seems like my almost weekly uh, <laughs> disclosure that the, the engineer on this project is JVA. JVA has a lot of projects in uh, Boulder. And I have a project in Blackhawk uh, on which uh, JVA is the engineer. Um, and we are each working for the applicant. I have no contractual relationship with JVA. Uh, we are both agents of the same applicant. Um, and uh, according to the code of conduct for board members, um, this is something that I need to disclose, but does not require recusal. Harman, can you be fair and impartial in the review of this application and base your decision solely on the evidence presented to you here today? I can. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to Elaine McLaughlin, who is the case planner on this matter. Elaine. Thank you, Harman, and good evening, everybody. Um, while this is booting up, um, <clears throat> might take a second here. Um, I'm just going to jump right in and start with the location and context. Most of us are pretty familiar with it. It's a central location in the Gosco neighborhood, halfway between or roughly halfway between Arapahoe and Canyon. Downtown's just a few blocks away to the northwest. The civic area is just due west. Um, and it's on a number of bus lines. Um, 
And of course, the downtown station's just a couple blocks away, but uh, uh, Long Canyon is the Bolt, the 205, the 204. Um, and then along Arapaho nearby is the Jump. And then um, in terms of the BVCP context, of course, it's um, uh, high density residential. And in this particular case, um, it meets the definition as it's near a major corridor and services. Um, and the use, um, it, as the definition um, reads, is it mostly consists of attached residential and apartments of more than 14 BUs per acre. And of course, in keeping with that, the zoning on the right is residential high two, RH2. It's defined as high density residential, primarily for um, a variety of types of attached residential units. And then it's important to note there's a small area of open space other in the northwest corner of the property and that aligns the North Boulder Farmer's Ditch. Um, it's defined as public and private land designated prior to 1981 and the city and county would like to preserve, uh, but by itself it doesn't ensure protection and relevant to the ditch, the BBCP states that it may be applied to ditches uh, but it should not be used to interfere with the operation of the ditch without agreement. So in this case, um, as it describes in your packet, uh, that ditch is being preserved through an easement. Then the property is located, as you can see, primarily in the 100-year floodplain, um, and that portion that's in the ditch is, is in the um, high hazard zone, Portions of 17th Street, as you can see, most of 17th Street is in the conveyance zone. Um, and in this case, the requirement for the flood, 100 um, year flood zones to elevate above the base flood elevation, which in this case is about four and a half feet. And then just taking a look at the context, um, uh, just immediately north is the recently constructed 25,000 square foot three story office building. It's known as the Williams Building, and it also has a, a large surface parking lot. Um, I've superimposed the plan for that that you can see um, since we don't have an aerial that shows that, but it's a fairly substantial parking lot as well. And um, that used to be the Wells Fargo drive through banking, some of you may recall. And so uh, between the new office building and the site you can see just below the new office building is the, the North Boulder Farmers Ditch. And, that a portion of that is actually contained in a scenic easement, open space scenic easement that's associated with the office property. And then to the south or east of the site rather is a, a number of attached apartment um, buildings and condominiums of varying sizes, um, eight to 10 uh, townhome units and a 20 unit apartment building. Um, just adjacent to the property is a single family residence in the front and a single family in the back. Um, and then just behind the property is a dentist's office. It's important to note 17th Street's a designated as a collector in this area and there is a, an existing bike lane along 17th. And so while there's on street parking across 17th and you can see down the street as well, um, there's no parking directly in front of the building or this site. So then that uh, roughly 9,800 square foot site itself had an existing duplex and detached garage with a long driveway access off 17th and the buildings were recently granted demolition permits. So then on to the existing site, the applicant's proposing a new building for six residential units that are accessed off that same curb, curb cut and um, the parking's proposed at the ground floor to address flood considerations, it's tuck under parking. There's a small lobby area um, and then um, a number of parking places um, down below. Um, the three-story building shown here is looking northwest has six stacked flats. There's three on the second floor and three on the third floor and they range in size from about 890 square feet to about 1200 square feet. Um, it's uh, proposed at um, the buy right height standard of 35 feet. And um, as I noted, the tuck under parking, there's eight um, vehicle spaces. There's 10 long-term bike parking spaces. And then that parking is screened from view, as you can see in this rendering with a contemporary curved wall that has perforated panels that also serves to 
essentially draw the eye into that um, front facing entrance. There's also upper story uh, front facing balconies and those also provide for shade on the ground floor and the second story balconies. And so you can see it's essentially contemporary style. Durable materials that include horizontal wood and metal siding and there's divided light windows. So for the project, um, there is a request to reduce the minimum lot area of 3,000 square feet per dwelling unit to um, 1,638 square feet per lot area uh, per dwelling unit. And that, of course, can be done through the site review process. And there's also a request for a little bit uh, shorter of uh, interior side yard setback. You can essentially get a sense of that on um, in the image of six feet where 10 feet is the standard. And that's just for those upper balconies and then that um, awning on the top. So then for key issue number one, um, this is with regard to BBCP policies. And of course, um, top of the list is um, jobs housing balance um, where Boulder is, and it's gonna continue to be a major employment center with the university and the federal labs. and other large employers and so this policy suggests the city wants to encourage new housing near transit and where people work um, as is this context um, and then similarly there's policies that emphasize a compact development pattern and sensitive infill along with enhanced design and energy efficient design and in this case the site's in a transitional location it's between the business corridor along canyon and then, of course, that variety of different types of residential uses, um, mostly multifamily in this context, uh, probably owing to that RH2 uh, zoning. And uh, then similarly, the site review criteria seeks to implement those policies in that um, it's a, an attractive, energy efficient, urban context residential building. It has durable materials and a density that's in keeping with the comp plan. Um, and that the applicant proposes to augment this um, very walkable and bikeable context with both a new walkway as well as bike parking. And with that, stack, staff recommends the planning board approve the application with the recommended motion. And uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, before we, uh, we have questions, and you can take down your slideshow if you don't mind. Thank you, Elaine. Um, before we go to questions, I have to correct my, uh, my disclosure. Um, JBA is the um, engineer of record on the call up that we didn't call up. And as it turns out, and I don't think it was very apparent from the, uh, from the uh, packet that we received, but Scott Cox and Associates is the engineer of record for this site review item. And I'm not going to repeat myself. I'm going to say that I have the exact same um, disclosure to make for Scott Cox and Associates as I did with JVA because we've used two architects on that project. And so they've both served that same client that I serve. So Hella, if you want to um, uh, confirm that with me again, um, that's fine. And in addition, um, I will add that the engineer who's here representing Scott Cox and Associates is a friend and fellow Little League baseball coach. Uh, we both have sons in South Boulder Little League and, and we coach together. We coached together before coronavirus um, ended the season this year, but we coached the year before and that's Michael Friesen. Um, so I have a, a personal relationship with the uh, individual engineer who's here for Scott Cox and Associates. So, Hello. Yeah, I'll ask you the same question. Can you be fair and impartial in reviewing this application and base your decision solely on the evidence presented for the hearing tonight? I can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, now I saw that Sarah Silver had her hand up to ask a question of staff. Um, uh, it was just a quick question. Um, so the, set, the side yard setback is uh, 10 feet normally. Um, can you just give us a sort of context for understanding why that is the setback versus, I'm just sort of curious what the purpose of that setback is. 
Uh, I honestly don't have a good answer for you. Um, I, it's a higher density setting. Um, perhaps that's part of the reasoning, but I honestly don't know what the origin of that was. So it's, it's not about privacy for the neighbors or it's just, that's just the, the, the standard. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to understand the context. It's, it's a relatively um, common side yard setback for most of Boulder. So I'm not sure that it's necessarily specific to this context, but. Okay, uh, thanks. I just, I just was trying to understand if there was a particular reason behind it um, in a, in a high, more dense neighborhood. So thank you. John? Yeah, uh, just wanted to ask if there were ever any plans or intentions to um, use the ditch right of way as some sort of a multi-use path or, or transit connection but, uh, past this property. I don't believe there is a, a plan line in this location. Um, it would have come up in the review, but I don't believe that's the case. Most of it is um, evidently part of the property to the north, that uh, bank, former bank property. And so they did keep it into an open space scenic easement in that location on that side of the property. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yes, um, I just wondered um, <clears throat> if there was discussion about uh, upgrading the uh, uh, sidewalk um, as uh, called out by the community cycles folks in terms of uh, pot potentially looking at um, widening it a bit and uh, making it a detached sidewalk if that was part of the part of the uh, discussion leading up to this. So uh, that is correct that it's a, a five foot detached walkway that's proposed and that is the standard for this type of setting. So um, that's what the applicants fleshing out with their proposal. So that will be an improvement to existing conditions. Correct. Thank you. David, uh, Peter? Um, how does that segue in with the uh, sidewalk on the new Reynolds building? I assume it's just a straight continuation of whatever improvements were made there. I'm sure it's in the material and I just skipped over it. Well, the in between there, of course, is that um, it's essentially the bulkhead for the ditch. And so at that point, um, it becomes an attached walk. And so you can sort of see that in the images that are in the packet. Um, it would essentially be a detached walk like the Reynolds property is. So the transition point, I guess you could say, is just addition to that ditch. Okay. And, and Peter, for those who aren't, as in tune with the Boulder real estate market as, as you are. The Reynolds building is the, the building on the corner of 17th and Canyon that used to be a Wells Fargo bank? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no other questions for staff, uh, let me turn it back over to Elaine to help the applicant with the applicant presentation. Okay, I'll uh, get this um, ready to go. Um, and then Lauren, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. Hi, my name is Lauren Folkerts and I'm an architect with HMH Architecture and Interiors. I wanted to start by thanking the planning board members for their time and energy that you put into serving your community and staff for the hard work you put in every day. We're excited to show you this project tonight we've been working on for quite a while. Elaine, I thought you gave a really great presentation, very thorough, so I'll try and keep it short. Um, this six unit condo building was originally conceived as a project that the developer, contractor, and architect would create for themselves to live in. The project we're showing you today is based on balancing a number of competing interests. There's the immediate neighborhood with its mix of uses and architectural styles. 
the city's need for housing and the neighborhood's desire for more available parking. The development team's desire for units affordable enough for themselves to live in, the ditch and the sometimes contradictory desires of both the ditch company and the city, a relatively high floodplain and a relatively narrow lot. There are people who say that there are no easy lots left to build on in Boulder, and this is certainly no exemption. Um, I wanted to start with the overall aesthetic we landed on. This is a, this is a response to the mix of styles, the white trim, uh, divided windows, front porch, and setback of the building mass are in response to the Victorian directly next door. Linear horizontal lines, the flat roof, the larger glass respond to the mid-century mo modern structures both behind and across the street from this property. We have south-facing windows with overhangs to reduce summer cooling demands and wood and metal siding to bring a level of detail and human scale that we felt was appropriate to a residential project. Next. Let's see if I can get it to work. Sorry, it's a, there we go. Let me go back one. What we are asking you to review tonight and hopefully approve are two modifications. The first is the number of units. While the overall size and shape of the building is by right, we would like to increase the number of units from the three that we are allowed by right to the six that code allows for by review. We think this higher number of units is the right thing to do in this location. There are both bus and bike lanes nearby. The increased number of units means we'll pay more into the inclusionary housing program and the smaller units mean less impact per unit. And to address neighborhood concerns about parking, we will not be asking for a parking reduction. And if we were allowed, we would provide street parking, um, but because of the floodplain where we can't. Um, next. The second modification we are asking for is an increase in balcony depth. We are asking to increase the balcony on the site, south side. Um, and Elaine, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're only asking for an additional 18 inches because we're allowed to hang 30 inches into a side yard setback of 10 feet or more. So we're going for a total of 48. Um, we think that this larger balcony is important to making the space usable, um, alleviating, or act, sorry, activating the front of the building um, and it's in character with the existing neighborhood. Next. So the two main issues staff brought up is does this project on balance meet the relevant policies of the Boulder Comprehensive Plan? Um, and I think Elaine addressed very well that I think it does. Um, next. And then does the project with its propo um, proposed modifications to the land use code meet the applicable site review criteria. This one was a little more difficult and we worked through staff with a number of issues here. Um, sort of the most difficult one is the requirement for transparency and activity on the pedestrian level. With our relatively high floodplain, any residential units that we wanted to put on this site, the floor level would have to be raised at least five and a half feet off of the sidewalk. And given the more extreme weather events that are, we're predicted to face in the future, I think we would probably want to do an additional buffer beyond that. That results in a first floor level at or above the eye line of most pedestrians. And we didn't think that that would meet the intent of the code. Um, it also makes impossible, it makes it impossible to get three floors in above the floodplain and brings um, residential units essentially closer to the flood elevation. Um, we've looked at options with a larger lobby in front and an art installation, but were uh, recommended by staff to look in a different direction with less floor area in the floodplain. We landed on the iteration you see in front of you where perforated metal screen allows some connection between the sidewalk and the parking behind, creating transparency and activity while screening 
the parking and providing a friendly face to the building. Next. And the last item I want to bring to your attention um, is the ditch. Um, this is an area where finding a solution that satisfied all parties was challenging. Um, at the beginning, we worked with the White Orock Ditch Company and their main concerns with uh, this stretch of ditch is the access and ease of maintenance. Much of the surrounding ditch is relatively difficult to access and therefore maintenance is also difficult. Um, initially, the ditch company was interested in encasing or building concrete walls along the ditch to reduce maintenance issues. In contrast, the city's main concerns are maintaining a somewhat naturalized look and feel to the ditch to promote wildlife habitat and make the ditch more of a public amenity um, to align with site review criteria. Ultimately, we were able to provide the ditch company with access to our drive lane along the entire length of the site, um, back to the back of the site where the grade is less severe, allowing more access to the ditch than they currently have um, and allowing them to more easily maintain this section. Except for a small curb that we need to hold the edge of our permeable paving system, we'll be leaving the embankment in its existing somewhat naturalized state. We believe our requests for modifications are reasonable, minimal, and in line with what has been laid out as the vision for our community. We hope that you see the care we've put into what we believe to be a great addition to this neighborhood. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lauren, for that presentation. And um, do I have any planning board members who want to ask any questions of the applicant? Lisa. Yeah, um, I was just curious about kind of the perforated metal um, that's shielding the parking. And I understand the importance of bringing the parking up and not having it down uh, in a flood prone elevation. Um, but did you consider kind of turning, activating that more, maybe making it um, kind of a shared patio or shared space um, or something that people could use, or perhaps that's in front of the metal and just wasn't in the rendering? I was curious about what you thought about for making that a more active space than, than just the perforated metal. Yeah, so there is a porch that extends the entire distance um, and there's a small bench that will be in front of the metal screen. So we are kind of having, it's, and it's a fairly deep, gracious patio as well, but we weren't allowed to have any, um, or the city really wanted us to minimize the amount of interior enclosed space at that level. Um, so before we had a lobby and that lobby has been removed. And so it's just the porch area um, on the front there. And I'm sure it's somewhere in the packet, but do you happen, uh, can you pull up kind of what the depth of that patio is? I'm just curious. Yeah, let's see. I can also measure it really quickly too. Um, I think Elaine, if you pull up my presentation where we stopped, there's, um, we stopped on the floor plan there. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Um, so you can see the little um, bench and then everywhere where there's sort of that hatch pattern, mm -hmm. um, the vertical and horizontal lines, that's all um, patio area sort of elevated with the railing around and okay. um, a ramp to the north. Thanks. I think I saw John Gersel's hand go up. Yeah, um, in the uh, in the materials you you supplied, there's mm -hmm. some mention of uh, the intention that that these uh, condos not be lived in by students. Uh, and I wondered if how how that's intended to be and uh, make it happen, whether it's in the bylaws that are proposed or in some other way? Um, I, I don't think we intend on restricting purchase. That would run into some legal issues, I imagine. Um, 
I think the idea was more that the sizing of the units and sort of the quality isn't is probably going to make them not the kind of units that mo it's not they're not our target audience we're not designing them for college students i don't think that we would explicitly be keeping college students out but um you know we are designing this building with an elevator the development um architect developer and contractor that are hoping to own units here are getting closer to retirement and so part of their interest is having all the units be accessible in this building and um, it's meant to be accessible and walkable and sort of targeting a different demographic. So basically a statement of good intentions but no no intent to uh, make it uh, legally enforceable or so. No. Thank you. Is that uh, Question is that Hella is that even possible? John asked, int intimated that they're not making it legally enforceable, which implies that they could, and I was under the impression that they can't at all. Um, um, it's not something that we have a review criterion for in site review for you guys to consider, um, but from a for a private party, um, I guess I haven't analyzed that, but. Um, I, you'd have to be careful to not somehow violate the Fair Housing Act by discriminating. Like, group. Anyway. I, I can weigh in on this, Peter. I'd want to review it. Um, and I am not a lawyer, so please don't take this to the bank. But um, students are typically not considered a protected class. Um, so the ethical or moral implications of that would be separate. But I, I don't believe that they uh, fall under FHA. Yeah, it, it, the, the risk that I could see would be potentially somehow violating um, or discriminating based on race or um, as a protection for families. Great, okay, so any other questions from the board? Okay, uh, that's great. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Jean again. Um, if Jean Gatza can handle any public comment that we may have at this point regarding this project. Um, it's all yours, Jean. Thanks, Armin. I'll just reiterate, um, we will use the raise hand function to indicate folks, if folks would like to speak during the public hearing. Um, and I will call on those who have raised hands and unmute them. Our testimony will be by voice only. Um, each speaker will have three minutes to address the board. Please try to respect this out of um, fairness to everyone. Um, and instead of showing the timer on the screen, I've got a little yellow and red card. So I'll give you a 30 second warning and then a red please wrap up warning. Um, and uh, the last thing is in accordance with our meeting rules, we do need a full name associated with each person participating in this meeting. So if you plan to participate, um, please change your um, your name in, in the Zoom box um, to a full name or send it to me in the chat and I'm happy to change it for you. At this point, I see one hand raised. Um, I see Ann Fennerty. And Ann, um, you may unmute yourself and start. You can go ahead. Okay. My name is Anne Fennerty, 2805 Stanford Avenue. This will be very brief. And a lot of people talked to you before about building new units. I'm talking about what's happening to our neighborhood. And the building that I would like to talk about is 3485 Stanford Court. It's something that's being built by the city for affordable housing. Just a couple of comments. The Tabor Mesa Stanford Avenue yeah. intersection yeah. And I'm going to have to interrupt you. Um, we're, we're only taking public comment on the matter that's at hand right now. Um, did you not understand that you were supposed to make general public comment about things that we're not talking about tonight back at the beginning of the agenda? I don't think you're ta talking about what I mentioned. I'm talking about a traffic problem that we have due to a building planned into a very busy area in our neighborhood. 
And but I would, your, you this, this matter is, is about 17th Street in, in, in Central Boulder, Whittier. Right, but I thought there was a public comment, which is a general comment. If it isn't, then I will not speak to you. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, I, I think I'm going to make an exception tonight, but oh, it's all right. I need to. And we invited general public comment about 40 minutes ago at the beginning of the meeting for members of the public to speak to items that aren't on the agenda, which is what you want to do. Carmen, so, she hung up. Oh, she hung up. Oh. She's left the meeting. Yeah. I'm just going to let her talk. She's left the meeting. Oh, well. All right. Are there any other people who want to speak to this matter? I am not seeing other hands raised. Well, I feel bad about that. Um, okay. Then we're going to bring it back to the board for deliberation. And Anne, if you're if you're on and you want to call back in real quick, we we will honor your uh, your three minutes and let you talk to the other matter. Okay, Peter. Uh, I have an email from her uh, from the last time we looked at the Stanford Court thing. I'll just send her an email saying that uh, that you were trying to let her speak, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. And, and invite her to come back to the next yeah. planning board meeting to speak a general public comment at the beginning. Yeah, I think her hand went up right after general comments. So there may have been, you know, some confusion. It was hard to tell. Yeah, I saw her hand go up too. Okay. All right, Peter, yeah, you can talk this matter? Sure. So I wanted to ask about, ask the board, ask how we feel about the handling of the OSO uh, designation, the fact that it's remaining undeveloped. Um, hey Peter, why don't you just say how you feel about the OSO and how it's been handled? I think that the fact that it's remaining undeveloped and uh, that it's a minor portion of the property, I think that it's uh, acceptable to me. Um, this is not an area I'm an expert in, uh, but I, I wanted to throw out there to kick it off that it feels like a uh, an appropriate um, management of that designation that is often uh, confusing for us. Does anybody else want to comment on the treatment of the OSO on the site plan? John? Yeah, I, I agree with Peter. I think uh, what's being proposed is a reasonable way of using that land uh, in, and that it's consistent with OSO intentions. It, is there anybody else who wants to bring up um, something different in particular before I go into the key issues and, and pull the board? Sarah? Um, I just want to uh, play off of Lisa's comment about the um, that patio area. Um, I realize that this is not a concept review, but uh, uh, I've seen a lot of apartment buildings like this um, in Tel Aviv, and often those spaces that are between the grill and the sidewalk sort of end up being sort of dusty, empty areas. And I'm just wondering if we might um, urge the applicant to um, create or add a little bit more, maybe even if it's just some potted plants, just so that it doesn't become just an empty space. Yeah, that's my only concern. And I realize that in terms of the site review and the the uh, plantings and landscaping, the, the applicant has gone above and beyond what is required. And I really appreciate that. I'm just cognizant of what some of these spaces can end up looking like. And it's a, and they've come up with a very good solution. So it's just an additive idea. I'll kind of piggyback off the piggyback. Um, I, I also didn't want to get too into the weeds on it, but um, part of me wanted to recommend movable furniture. So that's for at some point down the road, but I, I think there are ways to make it a more active space that will come in time. So I would also add um, in response to that, that there's a, a requirement for the applicant to provide a landscape plan 
um, along with the application. And so, um, you know, we might, I, I didn't see uh, any planters in particular in that patio area, uh, but there's certainly um, private deck space on the side of the building that's near that grill and shrubs between the deck and the, the building. So I don't know how much the, uh, the applicants already um, managing that. Um, I don't see on their, in attachment C, I don't see in the written statement and plans. You can see it on page 71 of 85. It looks like all of the green is outside of that patio area. So, you know, maybe because it's shaded, it would be a difficult place to grow certain plants, but um, you know, there's certainly a street furniture idea that, you know, they don't need water and sun to survive. Um, and, you know, maybe the, uh, whether we make it in a, in a condition of approval or not, um, maybe the applicants hearing you in uh, your, your notion that that area should be activated. Um, anybody else have anything general before we get to the key issues? So I'll just start by saying, um, you know, I think it's, a, it's amazing that a project that is this constrained in parcel size by topography, by floodplain and the ditch, the rights of the ditch company to access their property and the need to park uh, as many vehicles as it did um, to come in here and only have uh, two modifications to the by right, um, the by right entitlements being requested. And one of them, the setback, uh, you know, the building isn't really an issue there. It's just the, the balconies. And whatever motion we make, should we make a motion to approve, I think we ought to move to correct the, um, the side yard setback uh, modification, which is now uh, considered um, six feet as opposed to the 10, which is required. Um, it should be, uh, I guess, uh, eight and a half feet because uh, as was, uh, I, I believe the applicant was correct that 18 inches is an allowed um, intrusion into the, the 10 foot setback for balconies. So, you know, between that and a, a density increase that's already a modification that's allowed um, by the code and, and appropriate in my mind for that area, um, the demonstration of the applications, uh, consideration of all the comprehensive plan goals. Uh, I have to just say, I'm really impressed with, with the project. So the key issues are, and let's just do the first one, does the project on balance meet the relevant policies of the Boulder Valley comp plan? Um, does anybody want to speak to that before we, I think, do a negative poll? Any particular comments? Okay, so who, who on the board does not feel that the project on balance meets the comp plan policies? Okay, so no one feels that the project fails to meet the relevant policies of the comp plan. Um, going to move on to the second key issue. Does the project with its proposed modifications to the land use code meet the applicable site review criteria in section 9214H? Um, does anybody want to speak to code compliance for any particular reason? Okay, then in, in, in general, we'll do a, a negative poll. Who, who on the board, if anyone feels that the project um, modifications do not meet the applicable site review criteria. Okay, so it looks like the, the board feels that the project with its proposed modifications does meet the site review criteria. Is there any further discussion or comments or uh, advice um, that any planning board member wants to put out there before um, we see if there's a motion? John? Yeah, just briefly, uh, I can say that I, I think this is uh, satisfactory, but if let's say the neighbor to the south had objected to that decrease in the side yard setback for for the uh, balconies, I would I would have certainly taken that into consideration. But given that we haven't uh, heard from any concerns from that neighbor, I I'm willing to move ahead with the staff recommendation. 
Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Peter, uh, David? Sure, uh, uh, yeah, I, I move uh, to approve site review case number LUR 2018-00034, incorporating the staff memorandum and the attached site review criteria checklist as findings of fact and subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the staff memorandum. All second. We have a motion on the table by Ensign, seconded by Gerstel. Um, is there any any uh, appetite for a friendly amendment just to make a note that the modification to 971 is to reduce the setback from 10 to eight and a half feet rather than six, as in the staff report? I think if staff thinks that would be a good idea, I'd be happy to entertain that. Then I would accept that as motion maker if that has a useful function. Okay, well, let's let's just check. Um, Elena or Hella, if you want to weigh in on, on whether we should correct the, the staff reporter, if, if, if it's the appropriate correction in the first place, then we'll hear you out. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Armin. Uh, so the, the reference in the code for setback encroachments in 973F, and I'm just going to read it, um, the outer four feet of completely open, uncovered cantilevered balconies that have a minimum of eight feet vertical clearance below, which may project into any required yard except an interior side yard of less than 10 feet in width, Balcony may be placed above another balcony if the railings along the exterior boundaries of all such balconies are not more than 50% opaque. The railings do not exceed 42 inches in height and there's no horizontal connections of any kind between the balconies except the wall from which the balconies are cantilevered. So that seems to, to go even a step further that says that there's no the way I heard you, that there, there's no uh, modification to the side yard setback required at all. Well, I'm going to defer to Hella on that, um, as this is a this is a um, modification that was um, determined by my colleague Shannon, um, and I'm going to see if Hella has any thoughts on that for 973F, and I can try and pull it up on a screen if you'd like. Well, just based on looking at what was listed as modification that talks about balconies and sunshades, um, and I don't know if, if all, of, all of that meets the exception that um, Elaine just read, but I, I think it's, it's okay to leave it in, even if it's not a modification, it wouldn't make a difference. Ultimately, if the finding you have to make is whether the project as proposed meets the site review criteria. So if there's a modification, there is no additional criterion to consider. It's, it just comes back to the site review criteria. So I think it's not necessary to make any correct correction. Okay. Well, with that, I think I'll withdraw the, the proposal for the friendly um, but I think, Elaine, you did identify the proper code provision in, in, in reviewing this uh, balcony. And it, it looks to me like that 973F describes the, uh, the, the balconies as proposed and no modification should have been required. Um, in any case, uh, I'll withdraw. Um, we've got a motion on the table by Ensign. It's been seconded here by Gerstel. And I'm going to make that the motion of the board if there's no other discussion. Okay. Then uh, the planning board moves to approve site review case number LUR 2018 0034, incorporating the staff memorandum and the attached site review criteria checklist as findings of fact and subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the staff memorandum. A call a roll roll call vote. Uh, David? Aye. And John? Aye. 
Sarah? Aye. Peter? Aye. Lisa? Aye. And I will vote aye, so the application has been approved six to nothing. Congratulations to the applicant. Okay, all right, that's, uh, that's it for our public hearing. Um, no need to take a, a break, I think it's before seven o'clock. Um, now, we can go on to matters from the planning board. Uh, are there any planning board members who need to bring up anything for the rest of the board? Thanks, Lisa. Um, Hella, let me know if this isn't the best time to bring it up, um, but I had a question for Hella about uh, talking to um, someone about their project. Um, that just brought up a variety of questions and I wanted to make sure that we brought that forward uh, to the board. And Hella, if you're comfortable, I think you can probably describe the questions and conversation better than I can. Yeah, so the, the question that Lisa had was whether it was okay to speak with an applicant who has a concept plan pending or has just gone through a concept plan review. Um, and, and you all remember that I always advise against ex parte communications um, in any quasi-judicial matter. Now, concept plans are not themselves quasi-judicial because you guys don't actually make a decision on an application, you're just giving feedback. So the quasi-judicial rules don't technically apply yet. Um, what I then discussed with Lisa was most of the projects that come in front of you as a concept plan ultimately end up in front of the board as a site review that the board reviews, sometimes only as a call up, but oftentimes they actually come before the board and then you do act in a quasi-judicial fashion and, and are required to be impartial judges and, and follow the rules that a judge would have to follow. And because of that, I've always advised uh, that best practices to also avoid ex parte communication with regard to a concept plan or before an application is filed. Um, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't have good arguments to defend a, a communication that would happen before an application is filed. I just think it's a best practice um, in your position. Mm. And it's, it's, it's going to require, um, I'll just jump in for one second, it's going to require disclosure because yeah. I think you know, it would whether, require you can, you know, whether, whether it has to do with your ability to be impartial or not, you have communication around that project that no one else on the planning board has and you have to disclose that as an ex parte communication. Sorry, Lisa. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say and I'm not trying to be um, cagey or obscure uh, around uh, what it was. But just in this particular case, I, I reached out to Hella just because I am a newer member of the board and, and I want to make sure I was doing it correctly and um, not communicating in ways I shouldn't. And in this particular case, I think um, the applicant mentioned that a variety of other folks have already talked to this person. So it was just kind of a weird position because I was like, well, now I'm saying I won't talk to you, but other people have talked to you and there's the formal legal advice and then the defensible legal advice. And so, um, yeah, without getting too specific on it, I just wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity as a board to kind of talk about that and, and to discuss kind of how we'll, we'll uh, handle things like that moving forward. Because I hate to be inconsistent and tell an applicant I won't talk to them in ways that other board members are because that feels a little, you know, like I'm being a stickler or something. And, and that's not my intent. I just, um, you know, want, want to do things as I'm supposed to do them as I understand it. So, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it, it does come up from, from time to time, as I, I mentioned to you, Lisa, and we had a lot of discussions about it a few years back when the board at the time created communication guidelines and one of the guidelines was to avoid ex parte communications also for concept plans. And we haven't talked about those guidelines for a while. And I don't remember if any one of you was on the board at the time we adopted them, maybe John? I um, think that may have been even before my time. I'm not sure. <laughs> there. So I, this is a really interesting question because um, not because Lisa is or isn't speaking to the applicant but or the person with the concept plan but because it my little radar goes up when you say that 
that applicant has talked to other members of the board. Um, and, um, you know, it's one thing if uh, a member of the public uh, contacts a member of the planning board to say, how does the process work? Because I think it's a sort of an obscure process for a lot of people until it lands in their backyard. It's a entirely different question, I think, when an applicant seems to be reaching out to multiple members of the board um, to discuss his or her project. Um, and it, may, it just makes me a little uh, curious. Not, I don't want you to say who it was, but it, it raises a question about are there applicants who are who might be lobbying in their own gentle way um, that we should be con and we should be concerned about that. So one of, I'll respond to that. One of the things that that I've found is that Boulder is a very difficult regulatory environment to be a developer in. It's one of the reasons why I keep having to make these disclosures about JVA. You know, there are just a few um, developers and just a few engineering firms and a few architects that have mastered the the difficulties of project review in the city of Boulder. And generally speaking, when we see applications from them, I've found that they've been respectful of my role on planning board and never contact me about a quasi-judicial matter. Um, it's interesting when someone from out of the community who doesn't know our rules comes in and they see your name on the planning board list online and your phone number and they just call. And that's happened a couple of times and I've had to tell that applicant that's not how we do business here and I can't talk to you um, and I choose not to anyway. So the, um, the, the gray area comes sometimes when we've got a legislative matter, like, you know, we've got an annexation or we've got a zoning change, you know, some a comp plan change. Um, and, and then you get an applicant who might be a local and who's very respectful, but all of a sudden they're calling you and you realize, oh, it's not quasi judicial. They want to bend my ear about this because I'm entitled to talk to them if I want to. I'll still disclose that I did, but it's not, you know, grounds for recusal or anything because it's not a quasi judicial matter. I'm allowed to make my own opinion about anything, make my own, uh, you know, make my own investigation if I want to, because it's not quasi judicial. And then two years later, you're still on the planning board and the, the same project comes forward, but this time for a site review, now that it's annexed into the city or something, and you realize you've talked to the applicant, but it was in a different context. Now you got to disclose that. So, you know, I think it's, it's generally just a good approach to limit your contact with project applicants because you, you just don't know when it's coming back. Lisa, what did you decide to do? Um, well, I, I, I wrote this um, applicant back after speaking to Hella and basically said, you know, thank you so much for reaching out and I appreciate, you know, your interest, but per my conversation, you know, with the city attorney's office and council, um, here are the reasons why it's probably best for me not to talk to you. Um, you know, and I look forward to seeing your project come back and, um, you know, maybe someday when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, seeing you in person and just kind of <laughs> um, And then the, the applicant wrote back, and, and that was when the applicant was like, well, you really could have talked to me and I don't think the rules apply that way. And I haven't responded to that yet. Um, you know, and said, I've already talked to multiple other planning board members and, you know, um, you know, and so I, I, it wasn't like meant to call anybody out, but just to be like, hey, like, you know, where, where are we at in terms of recommendations from the city attorney's office? Have we all heard that same advice? Um, you know, because I, I just felt, you know, a, a little bad that they're like, well, I already got to talk to other people, so I don't know why you're refusing and you know, and it wasn't quite that tone, but you know, I, I, I haven't replied quite yet. And, um, you know, and I, I just wanted to bring it up and, and just review what our approach is as a board, um, as well as the legal recommendations and, um, and just make sure we're all on the same page so that we're not giving applicants different, different information. Um, and I did specifically say to that applicant as well that, you know, choosing to engage might even mean that I would end up needing to recuse myself depending on the nature of the conversation and and that I, I just thought it was much better for conversations to happen with everyone present so everyone knows what's going on and there's not ex parte communication. So um, I, I kind of took a very clean party line, I guess, so far. <laughs> so that's what I did. Peter. 
So for any members of the public who are listening or who will listen to this uh, to try to gain guidance, uh, particularly from the applicant community, um, the time for them to ask us, uh, well, I feel like our, our positions are fairly clear to anyone who's been to any, even one meeting. Um, and the fact that our role here is to uphold and um, judge or look according to the criteria. So the time for them to have that conversation in a general way about, um, I think about projects I've done in other cities um, and you always wanna go take the temperature of the community and understand where things are and you go um, everywhere you can to do that because that's your, your duty to whoever it is you're working for or whoever, whatever you're doing. Um, the time is before the pre-app meeting. What is the gate that they pass, Hella? And at that point, it's um, it's a bright line, more of a bright line rule for us where we're not playing favorites or saying, oh yes. And it is a small town and Oftentimes you, back when we would all be out together in person, you say, you know, I, I can't, you know, I'm not gonna, I can't talk about that. Um, but it'd be clear, I agree with Lisa, if there was an actual, well, have you, what have you submitted? Where are you in this process? I think there's, there is no bright line, right? The most conservative legal advice is to avoid all of all those conversations because eventually the project would come in front of the board. Um, I've been to um, conferences where municipal attorneys have discussed this and some say, I think it's okay to have conversations before the application is filed and others say, no, all of that should be avoided. Um, you know, I think from a legal perspective, you have a stronger, stronger argument if, if not, if, the further away you are from an application, I guess, um, to, to support that that should be okay. But there is, there is no direct guidance. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's a good line to say if a concept plan is filed or in between concept and site review, um, avoid communications because there is actually a project at that point in time. Before that, maybe there's no project yet. You know, um, it seems to me like you're, let's pretend we're all able to get together as he or she says, you know, I'm developing a project here in Boulder. Um, and you say, well, I'm on planning, I'm on planning board and they talk to you about their idea I think that's one thing but if there's actually a a known concept plan i i'm a i'm i'm kind of with lisa and hella on this that um a, a, a more hand, arm's length you know I, actually it was peter who said just say i can't i i will i look forward to seeing that concept plan when it comes to planning board um and change the subject to what you all had for dinner last night or something i just I feel like we need to, we, the, 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 there's already a lot of frustration. I, this is the wrong word, wrong word. I think the public often feels like this, the process um, leaves them out until sort of the, toward the end, till the end. And I, I think we need to be conscious of um, trying to protect the trust um, that the public wants to have with city processes, particularly when it comes to development issues. And the, the more hands up, the more arm's length we, we are to that, I think the, the stronger the trust will be. And I'm so just taking the perspective of the public, not the applicant. Um, and I, you know, to the point of, you know, all the issues that came up with um, the Spine Road development and the frustration that I think emerged um, vis-a-vis -vis, um, questions about uh, 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 Harmon's relationship with an applicant. And I think we, we've solved that, but I do think we just have to be cognizant of 
our role in, in building trust with the public. Um, can I, um, I, I uh, because we are um, out and about and we do talk with people, uh, Lisa, I'm, I'm thinking about the person who you reached out to you. Um, I wonder <clears throat> if, uh, you know, there, there can be people who are applicants in some uh, realm, but they may also be on the chamber and have wanted to talk to board members about things that are more general. Um, I, and I, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking of a few of those kinds of people that, you know, of course, I live in Boulder, I meet with people to talk about general things and things that are legislative. If people have interesting things to say about the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, I want to hear about it. Um, so I wonder, and, and I'm, I'm usually, when I talk to people who can be applicants, I am very cognizant about things that might turn into quasi-judicial. So that's, and I will stop them. Uh, and you can do that real time in the room with them. Uh, so, and uh, you know, and I, I understand that it can create a little bit of appearance of preferential treatment if you do meet with people, but if there are people that really want to talk to you, you know, it's hard to say no if they're, you know, if they're uh, concerned citizens as well. So I, that, I just wanted to throw that out there because I, my mind of course is going through people that I've talked to in the past and I wonder if, if they had the impression that they had somehow talked to me about it. <laughs> site review and <laughs> we'll talk about EDCD. Yeah, Sorry? Uh, and I'll offer that in this particular case, it was, again, I'm trying to just kind of keep it general, but it, it was very specific to a certain thing that we have seen that was called out by name. Um, so there was no confusion that it was more of a um, broad conversation. Yeah, Those I'm always happy to have, you know, I, I understand the difference between that and talking about, you know, overall, what are we thinking for planning or the BBCP, or the shape of the city, you know, those are different than um, Downtown, what should it look like? Right, yeah. or, or even a district. Even you know. opportunity zone or something, but yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was very, it was, it was identified by name. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's a red flag. So is there any more on this? Any other comments, questions? Well, you know, I just want to say that I'm kind of looking forward to when I'm off planning board so I can talk about planning matters with people <laughs> because I just find it um, almost always the wrong thing to do. And I, I just don't, you know, I don't talk to my friends about it. What I do on planning board, I do in public and that's it. Um, you know, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation. I want to congratulate Lisa for bringing it to us. When I went to law school, I had to take ethics class and I thought it would be a drag. And it ended up being the most important class I ever took. And it's the one I think about every single day that I practice as an attorney. And, um, and it's fun. And it's fun to think about what your ethical obligations are and always try to stay on the right side of them. So I, I really appreciate um, bringing this discussion, Lisa, to the board and giving everybody an opportunity to talk about it with Hella and, um, and with each other. Thank you. Uh, are there any other matters from the board? Okay, then uh, I think we're gonna move on to matters from staff. Cindy, Hella, Jean. I have something, I just, it's so quick. Um, tomorrow is um, one of our, the city's closed and it's one of our furlough days. So I will not be posting, I know we have one person from the public on this call or on this meeting. Um, the audio video from this meeting will not be posted until Tuesday. So um, just if anyone's asking or curious, um, it's just the way it is. It is what it is. Okay. <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, I felt like I had something else, but oh, and we'll, well, so normally we would have a packet go out on Monday, but the packet will go out on Tuesday for the September 17th meeting. And I will be also sending out three sets of minutes on Tuesday. Okay, everybody be out on the lookout for those. Yes. Okay, anything else from staff? Hella, anything from the city attorney's yeah. office? Yeah, I was just gonna mention that you guessed the meeting was gonna be over at 718. Yeah, and you said 702. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've been prolonging it. I asked Lisa to ask that question because we were actually done at like 657 and I didn't want you to be right. So, you know, we had some extra matters. Um, debrief from the meeting. 
questions, ideas, thoughts, debrief? Okay. Um, calendar check, Cindy. Our next meeting is the 17th. Um, and then we have another one on the 24th. And then the uh, October 3rd. So we've got some back to back to backs coming up. So enjoy your long weekend and uh, have fun. Thanks. Can I just mention that on, um, I guess on the 25th, the volunteers for the city, and I assume that includes all of us, have been invited to a drive in movie. Uh, so that's like the day after our 24th planning board out at the res, but they don't, they haven't told us what movie it is yet. So I put it I on my account. Wait, what? Or it's just I haven't heard about Maybe, oh, uh, maybe it's, only, may, I better check. Maybe it's, I don't maybe know. Maybe it's only you. <laughs> well, I'm on this, um, I thought, I thought it went to all the planning board. Um, <laughs> it may have. I'll look look into it, and if you're allowed to forward it, then pass it along. Uh, I, it could be for the COVID <laughs> people. I'm on the COVID response coordinator. Oh. Group, so. Good luck with your race, David. <laughs> we can be your support staff, David. Yeah. <laughs> get us an invite. Yeah, I'll go. Oh, the, for the race, uh, yeah, that well, that's out on Facebook. If you're friends with me on Facebook, um, it's all over my wall. Um, you, all you have to do is go reply to that. Uh, and watch the live stream of me at the finish line. Nice. All right, you guys. Well, it was pretty uncanny that I predicted 718 and it's 718. So I'm going to gavel us out at okay. 718. Um, thank you very much for uh, another good meeting and look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Bye. 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 Bye